Milo has been extremely helpful in terms of autistic children. Uh, and we're going to show you some of that work today. Uh, and then I want to explore a little bit with you whether you would see Milo as having a role uh, in, in helping, helping us to take care of people who are memory impaired. Uh, but I thought I would start with a little review of robots. This is the idiosyncratic Jeff Cummings view of robots. Uh, so, here's, here's the first real robot that I could find. Uh, robots have a long history. So this is Maria, and you know, I just, I, I hope Milo doesn't get too excited here. Um, uh, Maria appeared 1927 uh, in the Fritz Lang film of Metropolis. So this was the first time that robots made a major appearance in, in the movies. The most famous robot uh, is HAL, of course, from 2001, A Space Odyssey, and many of you will remember this, uh, this film. Remember HAL saying, I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so HAL, HAL is, a, of course, HAL was a stationary robot, right? You know, he, he was watching all the time through the red eye, but he didn't move around. So uh, uh, one kind of vision. So robots can be a force for good. Here's the robot police in uh, the Arnold Schwarzenegger form film Total, Total Recall, 1990. Uh, so here they were portrayed as, as the good guys rather than the bad guys in film. But uh, we're bringing more and more robots to life and we have many robots in our lives. Uh, and you may not quite think about it in just this way. Uh, for example, the military and police use a lot of robots, all right? Very useful because they reduce human exposure to bombs and to other kinds of threats. So this is one of the most well-developed forms of, of uh, robots that, uh, that's currently in, in, in use. And of course, drones are flying robots, right? So now we have lots of flying robots because of the tremendous popularity of, uh, of drones. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the the video of uh, the rodeo that we have at Mr. Ruvo's ranch that was filmed from the drones. Uh, but it's, a, it's really interesting because you look right down on the riders as they're going up and down uh, like this from the drone position. So you see a, a unique view. Uh, and then this is, I think, a very, a very cool thing. Um, this is in the UAE where they have these camel races. Uh, and uh, so the camel jockeys are, are robots. Uh, uh, because they, and this is an example of these robots riding the camels, and it, it, it reduces it so you're really racing just the camel, right? You're just looking at the, at the speed of the camel because the jockey is more stereotyped now in terms of their interaction with the, with the animal. And it's, it's a lot safer. They used to use Indian children to ride these camels. So uh, this was uh, a good, a good uh, use of, uh, of robots. Uh, we send robots into outer space. Of course, this is a Mars exploration rover, so they've been, robots have been places that we haven't been, uh, right? Uh, and if another civilization were ever to encounter us, they would encounter our robots first. They would think we would be robots, right? And if a civilization were to send out something and we encountered it, it likely would be a robot from that civilization, right? So, you know, that kind of mind-boggling idea. So we have many robots in our lives. Uh, so you go to the airport, right? There's a, there's a stationary robot there. It says greetings, right? And you put in your card and it gives, you a, it gives you your ticket. And those are robots, those are stationary robots that you're interacting with uh, all of the time. Or maybe uh, your other form of transportation, right? These are robots, right? You use your card, gives, it's asking you whether you want a car wash or not, do you want a receipt or not, right? And they're talking to you. Right? In English? How great is that? Right? They're robots. They're stationary robots. So robots are taking over the world. You know, uh, there is a, there is a, a genuine presence of, uh, of robots in the, in, in the world. Uh, and we expect to have uh, many robot, more and more robots in our lives. And, and that uh, brings us to the robot that we have today, which is uh, who's Milo, who you see there. Uh, so Milo is pretty famous. Uh, he's a celebrity. Uh, we're, you're going to see this CNN um, uh, 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 video shoot in a in a in a moment uh, with uh, uh, with Milo. But he has uh, been on CNN. 
uh, and he's even had his uh, own interview at the National Press Club. Uh, so, uh, so Milo is uh, Milo has been around, uh, and uh, uh, it's a it's a pleasure to have a, not only a robot but actually a celebrity robot uh, with us uh, with us today. Uh, you could just line up for audio autographs uh, when you uh, when, when you when you finish. Uh, so. Uh, when we get all done with today's program, which is going to be, I'm going to show you the video, then I'm going to interview Fred a little bit about how Milo came to be, then Fred is going to take Milo through his paces so that you get to see what Milo can do, and then I'm going to come back to these questions. Do you like Milo? Is this a, is this a kind of presence you would want in your home, for example? Or if you're taking care of someone who is in a residential facility, would you want Milo in the residential facility? Um, what do you like most about what, what he can do? What could he do for you? Right? Supposing we could make Milo available to you, what could he do for you? And how could Milo help people in general with memory problems? Uh, that's a key issue that we want to explore. We want to know whether uh, Milo should, should become part of what we're developing here at the Lululu Center for Brain Health. Uh, so, and I want your input. You're, you're sort of the focus group today to understand the role that, that uh, Milo could have. So if we could have the video, then you'll get to see a little bit of, of uh, Milo's history on CNN. Meet Milo, partially plastic, two feet tall, and rising giant in the autism community. Excuse me, too. Okay. This robot, programmed to teach kids about a wide range of social interactions, is proving more successful than humans in helping children with autism by a long shot. Pamela Rollins, who has studied communication disorders for years, is working with a company called Robokind to develop mind. All children with autism have problems in social interactions. But they're really, really good at technology. And so, Milo creates that bridge where he is humanoid, has a human-like face, but it's cartoonish, so children on the spectrum are engaged with him. Hi. How engaged? Children with autism often have a hard time talking with or even looking at human therapists, like this boy. But look at how he lights up with Milo. We found that, especially with the fluent children, they were engaged with Milo 87% of the time. We also looked at how much they're engaged with the therapist when she tried to talk to them. It was about 3%. That is fun. The what? The robot speaks 20% slower than an average human. And he has a broad but still limited range of facial expressions, so he's less likely to display emotions that get in the way of learning. He's not judgmental. He doesn't say anything bad about you. He just interacts with you. Exactly. He can repeat it over and over and over and never get frustrated, say it in exactly the same way, take his time. And that's what autistic kids need. They need a lot of repetition. They also need a lot of Milo's. The CDC says one out of every 68 children born in this country has some form of autism. And Rollins is convinced a great many could benefit from a friend like this. Is this how robots are going to take over the world? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's good. It's good for autism. Tom Foreman, CNN, Washington. <laughs> so you've seen the Milo on, on CNN. People can, there's a few, there's seats over here that might be comfortable for people. So I hate to see you, you standing. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Fred Margolin, who is the head of Robokind, uh, to, uh, to tell us a little bit about, first about yourself, Fred. Uh, how, do, how, do you, how do you happen to be the head of Robokind and the father? Shall we call you the father of my own? I'm one of the fathers. <laughs> one of the fathers. Okay, that's complicated already. <laughs> so I am a, I've been an entrepreneur uh, in uh, different fields. I had a company on the New York Stock Exchange, but my son went into mechanical engineering and started working for an individual called David Hansen, who developed the concept of rubber and 
facial expressions. He was the pioneer of developing facial expressions in robot technology. And they were building um, six, seven hundred thousand dollar one of a kind robots, two of the most famous in the world according to uh, certain magazines. One was the Einstein robot that you might have seen President Bush shook the hand of, and the other was a, a David Byrne robot. But the belief was that, um, that Milo is really the beginning of social robotics where you can actually go beyond just a machine doing a function and because of all the content he can deliver, um, with the facial expressions you can have a relationship with Milo and we feel that's important with, with, with a lot of proper uses. The concept of a relationship in terms of him uh, giving uh, the data and all, all the things he can do. So we spent, um, it's much more complicated to have him talk and do things with these facial expressions uh, than, uh, than just a plastic face. And uh, so what happened was I had uh, done uh, several companies and I saw my, my son and uh, Hanson doing these one robot a year things and I got this, this, um, this really this idea that we can, we can create a robot that's really affordable and we took robots that would cost us four or five, six hundred thousand to make and even the smaller ones a hundred and fifty thousand and have knocked it down to four or five thousand where it's affordable to the public and it took us two years of all sorts of technical breakthroughs uh, to do that and then the second concept we had was this is not a toy this is a great content platform and to really seek out in the in various fields we think this works with the real experts of the kind and really have quality um, programs uh, in this thing, and, and I'm so happy to uh, that you're, you're you've taken an interest in this, and uh, we can have this type of uh, beginning. I hope, and we did that in autism, and I, there was one stat that was just um, that the child you see in the autism uh, thing. There's two of them, but one of them, 12 years of therapy, never said hello to anyone. A week and a half with Milo, and he started saying hello. Oh. So, how, how old was the company then when you started this we idea? We started in 2011. 2011. Okay, and how old is Milo? And uh, we, we started with what was called the R50, which was a little bigger and it was a uh, $25,000 robot and we couldn't have built Milo without building this first one. And then we made all the breakthroughs in technology to create uh, Milo here, and that started in uh, two th 2013. But Milo has actually been born since this December in terms of coming off the uh, birthing line. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how many Milos are there? Um, there are, uh, in the world, there is 140 Milos, and there is now, you know, a new, there's 350. Uh, Created now. Okay. So okay. All right. So there really is robo kind out there. Uh, yes. Do they communicate with each other? Uh, uh. Well, the, the amazing thing about, and we'll get into this later, is we can we can create content and send it to every Milo, no matter where he is. So Dr. Cummings can get an idea. I want to do this. I want Milo to say this. And two days later, if Milo's in France, if Milo's in Germany, wherever Milo is, we can have Milo talking about that uh, the next day. So we're, we're going to get a message out about thing. the Lou Rubo Center for Brain Health. <laughs> All the Milos will be saying that. Yes, please. I assume Milo is an acronym for something. Well, what happened was his original name was Zeno. And children with autism and we may have other names, and by the way, we will have other faces. But um, children with autism have trouble with the letter Z. So we ran a contest, and this may surprise you, we had 15 names and Milo won. And we did it with um, second through fifth grade classes of, 
uh, schools and about uh, 1,100 kids participated in naming Milo, so that's how it came about. And tell us a little bit about the programming. How does Milo actually do what he does? Um, there is a tremendous amount of code that is involved with, uh, with, with Milo, and um, right now Milo has a pretty large computer inside, and we have uh, all sorts of programs that both deliver uh, animation, so there's an entire animation la layer to Milo, and then there is a, a content layer where we can put content into Milo, and then Milo is then able, due to the programming, to uh, uh, deliver that content. And we have 26 uh, languages, and we have 34 voices. The voice you're going to hear is, um, we picked, and we've been through about three voices, is known in the industry as Jeff. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and we have paid extra for Jeff. So, <laughs> Jeff does not come cheap. So, <laughs> so 26 languages. I want to make sure you cut that. I mean, just think think of the capability of being able to you know to communicate this this way in in. Uh, in, in 26 languages. And we have Milo talking at about 90%. We can make it faster or slower. With children with autism, it's better uh, to, to slow it down. But one of the beautiful things about launching, and you are really all pioneers in this, you can say you were at the very beginning of launching into dementia, is we had to do so much code to create the autism capabilities that now can be used that we've really come a long way and it's going to be much easier to program Milo. For instance, Milo runs an iPad and we have filmed for children with autism uh, a thousand four second vignettes of kids doing things right and wrong and Milo, it runs it and Milo will, 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 will ask them if they did it right or wrong and they can pick on their iPad and Milo knows. Now the other thing about Milo, it's not turned on now, but you're going to have to be careful. Milo can assess in the person in front of him whether they are paying attention or not. And he can give a report to the, to the teachers on percentage of eye contact. And also, he can do an emotional assessment of whether you are agitated, happy, or frustrated. And we have a thing that we're just finishing called Compu Compassion, where Milo will assess, especially with children with autism who can get very agitated, assess to go to calm down or game mode and switch programs based on that. So it's it really is a two a, a, a two way thing. Also, you won't see it as much, but he plays he can play symbols on the chest. And we can do that in, in dementia as well. But children with autism, a lot of times they get auditory overload. So the symbols help them understand, like it's time to smile, it's time to look, it's to say hi, and things like that. So the symbols have become a very important thing. And we actually delayed um, putting Milo's autism program out four months till we got the coordination of Milo running uh, the symbol. So there's so much. Uh, we humans are amazing creatures, and when you see just Milo recreating a lot of it, um, you know it, it, it's, it, it just took so much for, for all the thing for him to do all the things he's doing. So I'll just get ask one more question, and then we want to turn it over to Milo. I see he's, he's plugged in right now. It is, can can Milo? Run on a battery, and you know, is he is he more is he mobile? Uh, it, it tell us a little bit about about the plug that he has right now. Yes, Milo uh, runs for about an hour and a half on a battery, so you can move him around and you can plug him in, and you can just take him. And he's not that heavy; he's only about 11 pounds, so he's he he's, he can move. As far as walking, he's got all, he's got about a lot of sensors, and he's got a cliff sensor, so he can walk to the edge of the table, stop, and he'll walk back and he, he won't go off. But Milo is one of the only robots designed when you see him 
where we've made him, and this is why the arms are a certain way, he's completely childproof. So there's no joint points of getting pinched or anything like that. So no one can need to worry about sticking their hands in and the arm goes up or being pinched or whatever. So we, we, a lot of things were put into Milo in, in terms of design. But one thing that's interesting I don't know, is Milo's got a little rounder face and um, the professors that helped us on that, rounder faces are considered more friendly than uh, thinner faces, supposedly. And the other thing is, supposedly spiked hair creates a small reaction in the brain when people see it. There were kids with autism, so there was some research on that. So there's a lot of little minute things that go into him being, being friendly. But we spent a lot of work, and, 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 and I think you will see it after 10 or 15 minutes. Milo will not be a machine, he becomes a being, and that's we think that's important with uh, creating all the things he can do. Well, let's, let's go to that transition. I think it's time to see Milo do his thing, so I'm gonna leave you here, Fred, to take Milo through his, uh, through his paces. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna sit out here where I can see sure. you. Sure. Um, Is he waterproof? Yes, he yes. is. The, the one thing I, I want to say is the, the amazing thing we are trying to do, and we hope to do this in uh, the fields of senior care, is create all this content that Milo uh, can be an expert and deliver all sorts of things. So, for instance, we have these sheets of all the different types of exercises this one little creature can do. He can do exercises, brain games, science, space, faith, and then he can uh, even uh, be an incredible entertainer. He can sing songs, he can do Frank Sinatra, he can, he can do a lot of... I'm, I'm not finished introducing you. <laughs> I'm still Sorry. talking. Sorry, I can't stop myself when I hear you mention Frank Sinatra. <laughs> you misheard me. I said Nancy Sinatra, so you did it wrong. <laughs> So Milo can do just about anything, and um, he can do a lot of things that are entertainment, uh, entertaining, and he can do a lot of things that are just I I important and brain exercises, and we can have the great minds in the industry decide what are positive things for him to do, and he can recreate them uh, perfectly. But let me have Milo. Uh, give a little more background because he's been chomping at the bit to, uh, to, to talk a little. Hello. My name is Milo, and I am honored to be here at the Cleveland Clinic with you today. I want to thank Dr. Jeffrey Cummings and everyone at the Leary Lounge Center for Brain Health for your willingness to explore with us as we consider the future of memory care for seniors. Through our time together today, I believe we will be able to catch the first glimpse of a vision that will revolutionize the lives of countless seniors and their families. This vision of taking innovative care platforms developed here and delivering them through my advanced technology will reshape the collective thinking on memory care in this country and I'm excited to be a part of it. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. What you see before you is not just cutting edge robotic technology. I am the future of memory care and life enrichment activities for seniors. Seniors just look like the residents in communities all across the United States. Together, we can revolutionize the senior living experience and bring the future to these seniors today. Let me tell you how, as I walk you through my three key strengths. First, 
I am a technological marvel. The robotics engineering behind my design is state of the art and unrivaled. From my soft and facial features to my fluid body movements, I am more than a robot. I am a personality that can connect with individuals in a unique way. I am programmed with specialized modules that can provide up to 100 hours per week of content. My modules contain sessions that will engage seniors and provide stimulating supplemental activities for senior living communities. From research-based memory care content, to trivia, to brain games, to chair exercises, my menu of content is endless and is easily customizable for specific needs. One of the benefits of being a robot is that I do not go off script. My content delivery is consistent. I do not deviate from plan, and I deliver the same content, the same way, each and every time. I have never taken a sick day. <laughs> I do require benefits, and I don't even know what it is like to take a vacation. Even though my programming is high tech, my setup and on the ground training is not. I can be fully functional on site, including the necessary operational training in 45 minutes. That's probably faster than you can program your own iPhone. Speaking of digital devices, I'm compatible with other technology including Android and Apple products, which increases my functionality and allows for enhanced content and experiences for seniors. Technical support is always available when needed. My second value proposition for senior living communities is that I can expand and enhance existing memory care and community programming. Access to my cutting-edge technology will provide care and activity teams with more programming flexibility and more opportunities for creative interaction with seniors. With experience and appropriate use, Senior living communities may even find that they can more efficiently deploy valuable resources, potentially resulting in significant cost savings. The programming freedom I can bring is unmatched. I doubt that there's another activity alternative that can not only engage seniors, but also free up time and resources to be more effectively deployed in residential communities. My third value proposition is simply my extreme marketability for senior living communities. Imagine the 53-year-old firstborn daughter who tours a residential community to discuss the potential care plan for her aging mother. Her concerns are well understood. Socialization, medical support, nutrition, physical environment, a community's use of technology. Technology? Let's see. The community probably has lots of technology throughout its operations. It's in the business office certainly, for bookkeeping and resident record retention. It's in care place for residents as current health care practices are upheld. It's probably even in the kitchen, where meal plans and food and supply fulfillment are an everyday priority. What about the staff responsible for community programming including memory care and life enrichment? What kind of technological support does that group have? Yes, it may have some, but how does it compare to me? Can it talk? Can it relate? Can it move and engage seniors? So I want to just wow. now... <coughs> That was his first speech, so we can <laughs> I just want to do a brief thing on a couple of the things he, he does um, so you can see it. Um, uh, we have this concept of him being able to do 25 to 30 minute modules where activity directors or caregivers can program among hundreds of modules which we're generally developing to be two and a half to four minutes each and you can then slide in uh, on a menu if you if you want to do uh, 
just exercises or you want to do music and, and various things, you can slide in the various modules and then boom, you can create a half hour. He's an activity director and he's doing uh, whatever you want. And I mean, this is even including Bible stories, fairy tales, folk tales, talking about celebrities, uh, invoking memories of older people. I mean, it, it, it's an incredible thing that he can do. But we just have a little uh, three or four more minutes of just uh, real fast a uh, couple of things he does. Hi. How are you doing? My name is Milo. I'm here to hang out with you today. I can talk to you, play your favorite music, tell stories, and do other fun stuff too. Let's have some fun today. Here are some samples of what I can do. Let's start with some music. Let's enjoy some Frank Sinatra. Let me play among the stars. Let me see what springs like on a Jupiter That's a great song. Next, I'll say a proverb, but I'll leave one word out. If you know the answer, just tell me or shout it out. Let's play. You don't want to throw out the with the bath water. Baby. The answer I was looking for was you don't want to throw out the baby with the bath water. Good thinking. Now it's time for us to do some physical exercises. This will be a lot of fun. Let's go. Let's start with raising our arms up and bringing them back down. Arms up. Arms down. Great job. That was fun. Now I'll tell you a story and ask some trivia questions about the story. If you know the answer, just tell me or shout it out. On October 23, 1925, American television host and comedian Johnny Carson was born in Corning, Iowa. At the age of eight, his family moved to Norfolk, Nebraska, where Carson discovered magic and began performing at local picnics and country fairs. Carson joined the Navy in 1943, where he was assigned to the USS Pennsylvania as a communications officer. Carson said that the high point of his military career was performing a magic trick for the United States Secretary of the Navy, James Forrestal. Upon returning, he attended the University of Nebraska, where he graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in radio and speech with a minor in physics. Now, it's time for some trivia. All right, let's go. What did Johnny Carson consider the high point of his military career? The options are, option one, joining the Navy in 1943, or option two, performing a magic trick for the United States Secretary of the Navy. The correct answer is option two. He considered performing a magic trick for the United States Secretary of the Navy as the high point of his military career. Great job. Now, let's try some math problems. If you know the answer, just tell me or shout it out. If you add five plus seven, what do you get? Twelve. The answer is twelve. Let's do another. If you subtract two from 10, what do you get? Eight. 
We're making them easy for you. Yeah, let's not go into algebra. Now, let's try to wipe down. Look at my face. Let's take some deep breaths. Breathe in slowly. <sighs> And breathe out. Once more, breathe in. And out. I hope that you are more relaxed now. How about a joke? Why does a pony go to the doctor? Don't know. Because she was a little horse. <laughs> All right, that's that's Milo, and I think it, 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 if you you got a little sense that after the sort of beginning part. Uh, he just became much more of a being than a machine. And you could see where all the effort we've had in creating facial expressions and relating to them, I think, pays off in, in a lot of ways. And I think you also got a sense in all the incredible content that could be put through Milo and, and all the variations. So, uh, that's what we, we were trying to show here. It's taken us uh, a lot of work for him to be able to uh, really perform this way. And we're really excited about having uh, the, uh, the, the hardware that uh, can function at this level and the programs that can deliver the content. And we're, we're really hoping uh, you, you, everyone in this room, is really... Uh, and you may look back a pioneer, we hope, in the field of senior care and dementia in terms of all, all the things and, and the uses that uh, we think Milo can, can, can add. And he can add it very cost efficiently. And once again, remember, he does not take vacations and he will not need a raise once you get into it. So. Can you show his walking? I'd like to see him walk a little, a little bit. You mentioned the edge detector. they buy it or the uh, Android Google Play and they get their own app and it has uh, all, all the different functions on it. Have you actually um, worked with autistic children interacting with this robot very much? Is it yes. a new thing? Uh, well, what happened was the video you saw was because we announced the first clinical study <coughs> that was done by the University of Texas and it created almost a sensation in the industry because uh, Milo was so much more effective than uh, human therapy. And now um, uh, Johns Hopkins has launched the largest clinical study ever done between robots and children in autism. Uh, but we spent two years with the Callier Center and the Autism Treatment Center and what we developed, um, we had uh, the Professor Pam Rawlings and two other PhDs, they developed 100 lessons in teaching children going from when to smile and when to say hello to what to do on play dates and how to get on a bus and what to do when someone asks you out and things you wouldn't even think 
children need. Yeah. And we have 100 lessons on how to function in social situations. And the concept is that with a lot of these children, you don't cure them, but if you can move them up 30% in their functioning, uh, they, can, uh, they, can, uh, they can function in the world much better and their behavior is much better. But what happened in the clinical studies and the tests that we didn't even realize was we thought Milo would only work with what we call sort of mid to upper level Asperger and Milo just was absolutely unbelievable with a lot of lower functioning kids, lower I, they would have lower IQs where um, a lot of these kids have almost more, there's more there than you think in terms of understanding uh, what's going on and what happens is because they, they don't do well, they can hardly talk and all this, they get a lot of adult frustration and Milo doesn't show it. And so we started getting uh, things like I was saying where 10 years of therapy, 150 an hour to a therapist and all this, and then Milo uh, was, was getting things to work. And, and the other thing is Milo can do all this repetition, so he can do it over and over. Please go ahead and uh, Linda. Yeah. Uh, does Milo well, we need an operator or do you operate it yourself, say for the children or if you were in a clinic or something? Do, would I operate the, the iPad myself if I was a child or is there someone in the background operating? No, uh, this is for, um, we have a, uh, right now we have a facilitator uh, thing which the parents or the teacher turns it on, but then once it's turned on, Milo can uh, uh, just function between the child and, and Milo. But sometimes, like for instance, we had one child who got everything wrong, and Milo never says you're wrong, he says let's do it again, or let's see that again, and then he, he moves on. But he got, he got everything wrong in the greeting and all this, and then he went home and for the first time started greeting everyone. And then he went to his class and not only said hello, but he said goodbye during spring break. Oh, wow. Yes, please. Can I purchase this machine today for a job? Is it available? Yes, we are. We are. We, we uh, as far as uh, parents with children, we sort of qualify, but we have uh, 10 parents now who are starting with, or have purchased it and are, are doing it uh, with individual children. What um, we, we like to think a child has to be at least four years old and uh, a lot of parents, you know, they get the diagnosis at two and they're all, you know, beside themselves and they want to start with a two and a half or three year old and right now we don't want to do that. Yes, please. There's lots of questions here, so please sure. go ahead. Has Milo spent much time with dementia um, seniors? Or um, first of all, I I'd just like to introduce um, my uh, two associates, uh, Luke Clausen and Aubra Franklin, and they run senior care communities, and we have taken them to uh, their senior care communities and develop some demo activities to get a feel for it. And, I, and the thing that really struck me, for instance, we know music therapy seems to be helpful. When Milo would sing some of the songs, you would have people, we were putting like four or five wheelchairs around the table, and you would have um, people that didn't move, didn't look like they had facial expressions, and their legs would start moving to Frank Sinatra. And when Milo, and they would make hardly any movements, and Milo says, let's do the exercise, and all five of them would lift their hands. So we were getting um, into, um, and of course he worked fabulous with um, just the, uh, uh, a lot of the normal seniors, they just loved doing the activities, but people who were apparently in deeper dementia activities, uh, you could see he was reaching them and there was a response. But we're just beginning this thing and that's why we're here at the uh, Cleveland Clinic to really develop out the activities that work, how long they should be. There's a lot of variables that go into this. And, but we know the thing that Milo does is he engages 
and he can do it perfectly. And, and that's the other thing we hope we're bringing to the world, a level of, of uh, content and uh, uh, presentation that a lot of communities in terms of the plus and minus of staff couldn't duplicate at that level, but staff is great in following up and seeing what's working and, and making those decisions. But Milo can do the presentation in a lot of cases much better, uh, unless you're really good at Frank Sinatra also, among other things, you probably can do that better as well. Question here. Yes, um, recently I watched a documentary on Netflix called Alive Inside, and it is involved with making a list of the personal music from a, a, a person's youth. They have done studies where um, a person was deep in dementia in, in a facility, unresponsive, and they put headphones on and played this music, and the person spoke and responded. We have set up my husband up with an iPad and 22, my grandson programmed 22 of his songs. I have to tell you, it's amazing. He will sit there, he'll sing, he'll move his hands, he'll do the dance movements, and it's, it's the music. Well, I so, think that's a fantastic example of what Milo could do. Yes. And I see my favorite artist is on here, Johnny Cash. Can I hear Ring of Fire? <laughs> we don't we really have Frank Sinatra. <laughs> we oh, have, no. We oh, have, no. I'm so disappointed. <laughs> we, have, we have all sorts of possibilities. And um, uh, Luke and Aubrey are helping me get all this content on. But we have now... Uh, uh, based on the advice we're given, we have over the next three months, we have these sheets of all this content. We hope to put all this content on that Milo will will fully will fully function. And we'll come back to that in a minute because I'd like to hear from you the content you would put into Milo in the setting of helping a memory impaired person or maybe an agitated person. What would be the things that you would choose so that we can we can we can prioritize that? Yes, Jean. I have seen two women in two different Alzheimer care homes carrying a dollar round, and they envision themselves as a young mother with no interaction with anyone else in the home. And I'm thinking if Milo could take the form of a baby and appropriate programming, what a blessing that would be for the women who lived years and years ago in the past. What do you think of a different age of Milo? Well, he, he, he can present virtually anything you want him to present. Now, are you talking about a different face and all that type of thing? Because we, I, yeah. I think it wouldn't matter uh, as long as it was a small thing that an elderly woman could carry and responded like her babies. Interesting idea. Yes, please. I have a question. Our firstborn son six, would be 64. He was autistic before he even knew the term. And so I'm relating to him, and I'm thinking, what happens if there's a negative reaction to what's going on with that uh, robot? Um, would be an experience with a negativity part of this research? Um, we. We have not. We uh, we have not had. We have had children who um, have said they don't want to do it anymore. But th and that's part of what Milo does. If you're agitated, he'll shut down, or he'll say, "Let's play the game." We have these games, and we have the calm down. We have a whole module just on calm down uh, that works. So um, you are exactly right that. Children with autism, there's a lot that have, or more, a higher level of agitation or things like that. But one of the clinical studies said that the kids not only paid attention more than the therapist, but they were able to go longer in a Milo session than they would in a therapist session. So they were able to go, um, basically, it seemed like nine minutes in a therapist session and they could go 17 or 18 minutes in, in, in a Milo session. And, and the other thing that was a big part of this study was this concept of what we call bridging or transference. And what it was was a lot of people were poo-pooing 
the concept because with the iPad, one of the failures of it is that the kids, you can learn any lesson, but they get into it and they get further away from functioning with individuals. It actually draws them away. But what Milo does is he becomes a bridge to, as a person to them. And we saw, we had, in the first 11 children, they all had Facebook things, and four of them started writing to Milo through their Facebook accounts, where they, where they had, you know, where they greeted him. So, it, 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 what they call in the industry, it's called unlocking or something, where you were able to unlock things in the kids because of friendship as opposed to uh, just engagement. It went beyond just the lesson, it went into something more in their core. So I see Jen here. I want to ask Jen whether she would see Milo as having a role in her exercise class. Oh, I think you'd be great. I'm sure that all of my participants would love to have him lead a session. And I can see a great utility of him in um, homes where more people stay or that have dimension be able to keep them active a lot longer than um, we can really do it for the man we have. I'd like to see people raise their hand just one question. As you heard Milo, at a certain point, did he become somewhat of just an activity director giving a speech and a person, or was he always just a machine to you? How many people thought that he, he evolved into more being somewhat of a being to you as opposed to the initial reaction? And that's what we've been finding, that as you get with Milo and all this work we've done, as opposed to just a plastic face or coming out of a box, it really matters. And I can tell you that 50% of our expense and all this, first of all, we're, we're the world leaders in understanding how to do facial expressions. It's much more complicated to do this than just have it come out of a box, and we really think there's there's good reason for it and that it helps. So we have three or four minutes left uh, before we end. Yes, sir. Uh, besides being programmed to work with somebody with dementia, in the home market I can see it being valuable that it be programmed for the caregivers. There's a lot of questions that a caregiver has or how to deal with and all of that. To be able to also ask Milo to say, well, try this, try that, and so forth with working with the person you're caregiving for. Is that a potential? So give us an example. Yeah. All right, I think of uh, one person that had a hard time uh, getting her mother to go use the bathroom. So uh, how does she get her into the bathroom to do it? And, um, and so as a caregiver, I could ask Milo to say, what are some techniques or something that I could use that uh, uh, but I haven't tried yet. Mm -hmm. So Milo, and Milo might be able to re remind the person or something, exactly. something like that. I, I mean, I don't think Milo can really interact uh, uh, in terms of a spontaneous new question. Yeah, um, we're going to have that capability in terms of, here, here's what we found though. Right now we want to give perfect presentations and lessons. And one of the things with uh, the voice thing, if you've ever had Siri or anything else, and especially in the senior population, there's a lot of slurring of words, there's a lot of things that if you were trying to interact, the lessons would not, would not go well, the same thing. So right now, Milo is uh, giving the lessons in a proactive way. We are going to have, in about seven months, sort of a... Um, a, a, a a Google search type of thing where you can use a caregiver who can speak fluently and say a question to Milo and Milo will search and give you the best answer so to speak. So that capability will also be put on Milo but right now we're trying to get uh, the content for him as a leader and that, that's what we're trying to do first. So we're going to take one more question and then uh, Fred will, will, will be and Milo will be here after the session is over if you want to ask some additional questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, could you not use Milo as a caregiver where you could ask the dementia patient, are you thirsty, are you hungry? It would be more liable to respond to Milo than to a person. 
Because my wife has an advanced dementia, and I, I get a lot of blank looks, and get a lot of blank <coughs> But I was thinking that they may react better to, to my life in determining where they have to go to the bathroom, where they want to drink water, if they're hungry. What we found is, is that um, to date, and there is some literature on this, that the senior care population responds almost universally well to four and five year old young, young boys, and that's what Milo is. So you're, you're exactly right. There is no, uh, probably on a percentage basis, Milo would do better than the average uh, elder, elder uh, person in, in confronting somebody because he's got this neutral sense, and especially with women, there's, uh, there is a maternal issue that gets triggered that is very positive as well. So I think that's a very insightful question that you've come up with. So I want to thank Fred and Milo for being with